If we don't believe God's already changed us, we won't become what he's already changed us into. We have to believe that. If we keep on telling ourselves, well, I'm a work in progress. Yeah, you're a work in progress, but if you keep saying that, you're going to keep giving yourself an excuse not to live right. You're not a work in progress. You've already been made new. Now, you need to renew your mind to what you've already been made new. Welcome back to Bonus Line Ministries. It's great to have you guys back. We're going to be talking about grace, part two. And, um, man, we're going to talk about getting your hopes up. I know we're talking about grace, but we're actually been talking about a lot about hope in here as well. And, you know, back whenever I uh, was graduating from high school, I remember getting, sending out some, uh, sending out applications uh, for college. And... You know, there came a point whenever Howard Payne University, where I went to Bible college, they sent me back a letter of acceptance. And whenever I got that letter of acceptance, guess what happened? I got excited. My hopes were lifted. And you know what? I knew I was going to go to Howard Payne University. And so then what I do? I acted in faith and I went to Howard Payne University, right? And so the same thing with the scriptures. The scriptures give us promises. When you read your Bible, there is an acceptance letter in here. And when you get that acceptance letter... You have to have your hopes be built up. The problem with this is a lot of times people say, well, I really hope this will happen. And what we find is that hope actually becomes a source of doubt because the truth is people don't really believe that it's going to happen. But I'm telling you, whenever I got that letter and it said, you've been accepted to Howard Payne University, there was no doubt in my mind. I knew for a fact that whenever I decided to go ahead and pull the trigger and decide to go to Howard Payne University, they were going to let me come. No no, no questions about it. And I just had to believe God for my finances, you know. But here's the thing. We don't do that. Oftentimes we say things like, well, I hope that this will happen. We read scriptures about healing and we're like, well, I really hope that maybe God will heal me. But you're not understanding that the Bible is a more sure promise than an acceptance letter at Howard, at Howard Payne University. And we're not really understanding it. So what I would encourage people is whenever you actually read the promises, those promises are designed to get your hopes up. And you hear people say, don't get your hopes up. No. When it comes to kingdom principles, the only way to have faith for something is to actually get your hopes up. And so uh, that's what this scene is going to talk about, getting your hopes up and actually believing what the Word of God says and understanding that, that God is not a liar and what He says is true. And so, anyway, very excited about this teaching and uh, to get into it. So, who are we? We're Boulders and Lion Ministries. If you don't know who we are, we do missions uh, We do missions work into unreached people groups. And we also have a men's home called the Barracks Discipleship Home, where we have guys overcome drug and alcohol addictions. And if you want to make a donation, you can go to boldersandlineministries.com or bombsyes.com. You can also go to 3hourcandles.com and buy one of our candles. These are all handmade by students in recovery. And all the proceeds go back into the ministry to help us run our operation. So anyway, I'm very excited to have you guys here. So let's get into the word. So last week we were talking about uh, grace. So I think we've title in this one, and I'm still haven't worked on it. I might have a new title, but I'm gonna call it right now Grace. How to get it? What it's used for? Okay. And uh, so we've been talking about a few things. So just kind of recap. Uh, first of all, we were, our first scripture we really talked about was Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 16, and it says, Let us then with confidence draw near uh, to the throne room of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we kind of broke that down last time. We talked about how you, know, you have to have confidence, and that confidence is not self-confidence, but it means to have faith in something, and we compared it to like a parachute and things like that um, to help illustrate the point. But the confidence is really leaning into God. And that when you go into God and you humble yourself to Him and yield to Him, then He gives you confidence. Make sense? Huh? Same one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So, we talked about this last time. And then we talked about also how grace, I'm just going to recap a little bit. Grace is not forgiveness of sins. Um, that would be mercy. Uh, we talked about how grace is, moving, is God moving on your behalf. And uh, grace is also... God taking a liking to you. Without grace, you couldn't even have access to the throne room at all. 
Okay, so grace is God liking you, you know, in a sense, he's favoring you, even if you're his enemy, even if you've done wrong things. He still liked you enough to give you a chance. Does that make sense? So that's grace. It's the initial grace, and that grace that grace doesn't save you. That grace just gives you access. Does it make sense? That grace gives you an opportunity to be able to receive forgiveness. After you receive forgiveness, then you can ask for grace for salvation. Does that make sense? So we even talked about... Um, uh, let's see here. Oh, I think one of the things we mentioned too was grace was God's faith in you in action. Okay, so God believes in you even when you, even if there's nothing good about you to believe in, He still believes in you, which is important because God's the one who speaks light into the darkness, right? And so, if God is able to look in the darkness and speak light, let there be light. And there was light. The same thing ha can happen for our lives. So our lives can be full of death, and God can speak life, and there can be life. So grace is important. Grace means that God has a dream for you. It means God has a vision for your life. It means he has purpose for your life. Make sense? And this is all before you even get saved. This is God's grace for you. Everybody has a measure of grace from God, even before they receive him. Okay. Because you can't even get grace. You can't even believe until you have some grace. And we talked about that. that was the last thing we talked about last time. Um, so let's go through a few things here. We talked about how um, you get justified by grace, by God's grace, through the work of Jesus. So it wasn't the grace of God that actually justified you. It was the grace of God that sent Jesus. Make sense? The grace of God sent Jesus, which gave you the possibility to be justified. Okay, and the same thing for, for, for faith. This is for by grace you've been saved through faith. So it's actually faith that gets you saved, but it's by the grace of God you can even have faith, and it's faith that gives you more grace. And we also talked about how it's a lot like a Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels track. You know, you put the car on there, and then the propulsion shoots the car, and then it goes around the track, and then it shoots the car again. And so the same thing with grace. Grace is, there's this initial grace that you get that gets you set off, and then you go down the track, and you're going to need more grace. So it gets, you get shot again with more grace. So, but it comes through um, three things, which we're going to be getting into more details about, which is knowledge of Christ, faith in Christ, and then also humility to God, right? So I'm just kind of fast forwarding is what I'm doing, trying to catch us up here. Um, also, we talked about how grace produces miracles. Grace is what gives us the ability to perform signs and wonders and be victorious in our life. Okay? So it says in Acts chapter 4, 33, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. All right? And then it says, Stephen, in verse, chapter 6, verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So it was grace and power. So you notice that grace and power are the same. They're, they go hand in hand. All right? So you can't get power without grace. So it says they had great grace. And that's interesting because sometimes, like I said before, growing up, I never heard anybody ever tell me uh, you could have great grace or that you could have more grace. They just said everybody has grace. And they would say things like, well, grace can't be earned. It just has to be given to you. And so, which is true, but it's not a full explanation of what grace is. I realize that grace is the initial grace you get where God can give you, forget, where God can send his son Jesus for you. That's the grace you didn't earn. Yes, sir. Do you think it was grace, or do you think that grace can command the wind and the water? Can it actually change the weather? So I think what grace is, grace is is God's favor on your life and you're able to tap into that grace to move things. Make sense? So yeah, I think that um, that's why it says right here, great grace and power. A fool of grace and power was, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So it was by grace, but it was the power of God. You see what I'm saying? So yes, I believe that, that grace produces, grace is the way we get miracles and signs and wonders. Okay? But you have to have faith. You have to believe. Basically, what it is, you have to have faith that God likes you. See? You have to believe that God would do that for you. You have to believe that God would 
move on your behalf. That makes sense? Like when you pray, you believe God's going to answer your prayer. Like when I'm done praying, I know that I'll have my answer. That's faith. But you're believing that God won't ignore you. You're believing that God has put his ear toward you and that he's listening. You see? But if, as long as we don't believe God's listening, we're not going to get what we're asking for. Because you have to believe. You have to believe that God really loves you. You have to believe that God really favors you. Sometimes that's tricky. A little bit of belief for you to actually pray. I mean, if you didn't believe a little bit, you wouldn't throw a prayer in his direction. That's right. That's right. You're hoping. I hope God hears me. A lot of times. Or we're, let's just put it this way. God's hope is not man's hope. Okay? Um, man's hope is wishful thinking. I really wish God would be listening right now, right? So when people say, I hope, that's what they're, that's what they're saying, really. Say, I hope, man, I hope this happens. What you're really saying is, I really wish this would happen. You're leaving up, it's almost like luck. But God's hope is not that way. God's true, God, true godly hope is knowing. Which could buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> what I mean is, it's having a promise, okay? So if God told you in your ear, pick these numbers right here, you would have hope, <laughs> right? Let's get some sound. So what hope is, hope is, is a wish that's a little bit more guaranteed. It's What it means is, it's something you can't see, right? It, hope is kind of like, Whenever you put gas in your tank, you hope that when you pump the gas that that they're actually going to put in as much gallons in there as the as the machine says. See, you're hoping, but you you don't just hope like you don't just earthly hope. There you you're really tapping into like a godly hope there because you really believe, you really hope that that thing's not lying to you. You know what I mean, and you trust it. So, godly hope always leads to faith, not doubt. Let's put it that way. Godly hope always leads to faith, not doubt. That's so good. Godly hope always leads to faith, not doubt. So, if we're doubting, then we're not really having hope. Hope is rested on a word from God. We have to have a word from God. We heard God. We can't see it, but we just hope. And we're putting our hope in him. That's what the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. It doesn't say that wishes deferred makes the heart grow sick. Think about, think about that for a second. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Why? Because it's a promise. Hope is a promise. Hope is leaning into a promise. Or wishful thinking, you don't really know if that's a good promise or not. You don't even know if you have a promise. Wishful thinking, wishful thinking doesn't have a promise. Hopeful thinking has a promise, and if you start to doubt, you're doubting the integrity of the one who gave the promise. Say it again. Wishful thinking doesn't have a promise. Hopeful thinking has a promise, and what you're really trusting in is the integrity of the one who gave the promise. So the, what we really struggle with when we believe is whether God was telling the truth. Because if God said it, it's a promise. And it's a hope we can put our faith in. Does it make sense? Yeah. Many Christians, though, they don't know what to believe. You know, the Bible will say that God heals them, but they won't believe it. You know, they question it. Well, well, you're not, you're, you're not really, it's not a matter, you're not having hopeful, you're not even having wishful thinking at this point. You're really just having doubts. You know, you're doubting in the hope that you have. The only hope you have is the Word of God. So whenever we read the Word of God and we don't believe it, then what we're saying is, God's a liar. <laughs> like when you realize that's what you're saying, it's like, man, there's nothing wrong with God, there's something wrong with me. Why do I think that? And so that's where hope really gets ignited because we really 
start to understand that God's not a liar, man, I really have hope. I really, I really have hope. Hope is the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm looking through a dark tunnel and there's a light at the end. I know it's there. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time before I get there. Yeah. I will get to the end and get that light. That guy's crazy. Yeah. That's good stuff. All right. So, um, also grace can be given to you, which I thought that was interesting. Grace can get, be given to you by others. So Romans chapter 1, verse 7 says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it seems like Paul's kind of, you know, giving them grace. It's grace to you. So something you can bless somebody with. That's pretty cool. You can say grace to you. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. You can get it from others. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Um, which on on the other hand, we've already been all been given grace. It's a matter of whether we believe it or not. Yeah. But I think the grace that we're talking about here is the grace for time of need. So what we're clarifying here is that we know, do we definitely there's probably more graces out there, but let's just stick with these two. There's that grace that God gives you to even have access to mercy in the first place. Okay. So we're going to call that saving grace. All right. Then you have the grace for time of need. Now, that's still saving grace, but it's, it's a grace for a specific need. Like, I need, we need to believe God for our finances. So we're going to believe we're going to we're going to pull on the grace of God for our finances, you see? So, that's the grace for the time of need. And that's what we we're talking about here. So, when it says grace to you and peace from God, I think it's really talking about that grace for time of need. All right, grace. So it says you cannot even uh, you can't even believe without grace. Okay, so we talked about that briefly at the end the last time. Um, basically, talking about the reason why we say this is because when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. Okay. Oh, uh, the Bible also teaches us in in one of the spiritual gifting lists that um, that faith is a gift of God, and it teaches us that. Grace is how we get gifts. It's very interesting. So there's there's a there's a grace God gives you before you can even have faith. He's the one who gives us the ability to even have faith. Faith is the actual grace. All right, so faith is believing in something you can't see. Right, but okay. Mean. But grace so you have to have faith in that in the first place. But what okay, let's put it this way. It's only by grace that you can even believe. All right. So the fact that I can even have faith, that's grace from God right there. Make sense? So I ha what I'm trying to say is we try to wrap up the grace of God into some weird things, I think. And it's not really been I don't know if it's been explained well enough. Grace comes in different measures, grace comes at different times, and grace comes in different forms, okay? So there's a grace, that saving grace, and it, that that grace, there's also a grace, though, it allows me to even believe, okay? Because if God was so against me, he would harden my heart, and I wouldn't even be able to believe, you see? We know God hardens hearts, because we've read, read about it in the, in the book of Exodus, where he hardened Pharaoh's heart. I believe he hardened it, which means it was already hard. Okay? I believe that God I believe he was already resisting God. The Bible says God resists the proud. So it would God wouldn't harden Pharaoh's heart unless Pharaoh was already proud. So we can't just take one scripture out of context. We have to understand that God knows things, God knows our hearts, and that also God is dealing with us every day. Okay? So we see that Pharaoh had his heart hardened had had his heart hardened. Okay? But I believe it's because he was prideful already. He wasn't going to submit. God gives grace to the humble. So there's interesting things there. It makes sense? I don't know. Am I making sense about that initial grace? That grace that comes before faith? Yeah. So, and, and here's how we know that. Because uh, even in John chapter 6, verse 43, it says, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
So we know this is John, this is in John chapter six, verse forty three through forty seven. So we, that's grace. The fact that God's knocking on your heart, that's grace. You haven't been saved yet, you see. But because he's knocking, he's beckoning you, calling you. That's, that's grace that God has chosen you. Does that make sense? So if the disciples were casting their nets out in the sea and Jesus comes by and says, come follow me, that's grace. That's Jesus picking them, choosing them. He chose his disciples. But they had a choice too. They could choose him or they could not choose him. So that grace that he comes knocking on your door, that's God drawing you. No one can come to God unless he's first drawn by God. And then, but then you'll get into some Calvinistic thinking where people will say, nah. So sometimes people, God chooses people and God doesn't choose people. Well, you got to read the rest of the Bible. You can't just take one scripture out of context here because Matthew chapter 18 says, so if not... So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So we know God doesn't desire for the little ones to perish. Now, I think that little ones really pertain to everybody on the earth because we're all little in God's eyes. But at the same time, some people might think it was just talking about innocent people. Okay? Right? Just the little ones. He doesn't want the little ones to perish. Well, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should re reach repentance. So we see here, it's not just innocent people. It's all people, anyone. Wish, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance, right? All. That means that God wants everybody to... Re that means that if that's true... Then John chapter 6, verse 43, when he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws me, that means that God's going to knock on everybody's heart. Every single person out there, God's going to beckon and call to himself. You see what I'm saying? The point is, grace is given to everyone. God has chosen everyone. The Bible says, or the Bible says that God, uh, many are called, but few are chosen. You see? So God calls everyone, but not everybody responds. Make sense? And the scripture in Ezekiel, I wanted to actually give you that scripture. Let me find that one real quick. Um, I didn't give it to you last time. Um, it's Ezekiel. Um, Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33. The word of God came to me. Okay, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. And it says, say to them, as I declare, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the, de in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O Israel? Right? So we, so we see, this is so awesome. So we see that in Matthew chapter 18, he's referencing some people that could be innocent ones by saying these little ones in Second Peter in Ezekiel, it's saying even the wicked. So we have the innocent and the wicked. And then Second Peter says, just so you don't miss it, anybody. He wants all. He wants everyone to come to repentance, right? All right, so does that make sense? You can't even really have opportunity to believe without grace from God. Make sense? So grace is a pretty interesting thing. All right. All right, so we're going to go to grace uh, comes by knowledge, right? Second uh, Peter that was a recap of last time, so we are now back on track. Uh, 2 Peter or chapter 1, verse 11. No. <laughs> That's why I was reading 12. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 11, it says, May grace and peace be multiplied. So we know right here. So now we have <clears throat> initial grace. Okay, can be described as knocking. Okay, it's the call of God. Okay, it's the sending of Jesus. 
Then we have grace. Um, that saves, okay, Bruce, that saves. So this is after you believe, God, the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. So this, this initial grace gets you to faith, and then faith gets you to grace that saves, okay? And then we have grace for time of need. And now we're going to talk about some other aspects like multiply. Multiply grace. Very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Multiplied grace. Okay, so may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain, that pertain to life and godliness. So what does this multiplied power have to do with? I think that we are talk, we've definitely talked about the, the grace for time of need, but I think that now the multiplied grace is not just time of need. Multiplied grace has to do with all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's good stuff. His divine power has granted to us all things... So, granting his power that grants all things. So, I think multiplied grace has to do with this right here. It's his divine power that's granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay? How? Through the knowledge. So you get this one through knowledge, through learning about Christ. <clears throat> this is why it's important for us to read our Bible. This is why it's important for us to study the scriptures, for us to have Bible study, for us to sharpen one another, for us to encourage one another in the Word of God. All right? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So this is, now he's even teaching us some more about Christ. So, hmm, God has called us to his own glory. That's very interesting. Uh, he's called you to his own glory and excellence. That's so powerful. You know, the Bible says that um, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But this is saying once we've been called into God's grace... He'll grant us multiplied grace that gives us, what is it? Grant us all things that pertain to life and godliness, right? So he says right here, but he's called us to his own glory. That's something that a lot of Christians don't even believe. They don't under, they believe God gets all the glory. But God's called you to his glory. God does get all the glory. But he's called you to his own glory. So powerful. The glory, what is God's glory? And we probably can do a whole Bible study on this, but just to make it brief, God's glory is all of his goodness and his good name. Um, that's what it is. So whenever he calls us to his own glory, what he's saying is, I'm going to give you my goodness, and I'm going to give you my good name. So we take on his goodness. We take on his glory. That's why we become more like God, because we are entering into his glory. And the Bible even teaches us glory. We go from glory to glory. You know, you know, you, you came up to me yesterday and you said, I'm just afraid of failing. Well, that's all right. That's a good place to start. But don't be so afraid of failing and get beat up, especially when you fail. But we go from glory to glory, which means that we, we are this level and God's taken us to a higher level. Everybody sins, even after they get saved, you know. And we struggle... And every sin is a deliberate sin, you know. But the Bible says that we can't keep on sinning. So if we're going, if we're going, if we're a child of God, then we're going into the glory of God. It was the glory of God that tore you up when you were contemplating going into sin. That's the glory of God in your life. That's a good thing. You know, it's not, not so good if we disobey what happened in our heart. 
But the fact that we feel it in our heart is a good thing. That means God's changing us. There's hope for us. See? So, we go from glory to glory. So you might be at this glory, and God's taking you to another glory, and he's going to take you to another glory. All right? And eventually we'll die and we'll be completely glorified. We have a new body and everything. But even right now on this earth, as our mind is being renewed, we go from glory to glory to glory. We start learning more things. We start operating in different grace. May grace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Christ. People who don't study the Word of God, you know, I grew up in church all the time and never believed in supernatural healing from God. Well, I, that was a glory that I wasn't experiencing, you know? And it was a grace that I wasn't operating in. But in the knowledge of Christ, I started to discover, hey, man, people can be healed. So then I started seeing people get healed. Everybody I pray for doesn't get healed yet. But I've seen a lot more than I used to. Because back in the day, I never saw anyone get healed. Ever. In fact, every time I prayed, I just pretty much, I pretty much had more faith in unanswered prayers than I had in answered prayers. You know that song? Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered. I mean, my, that, dude, that's such a, an abomination. <laughs> I think. But, I, it's, you know, it's a catchy song, but. I mean, I remember hearing that song, and it, it created my doctrine. It killed my faith. You know? I never believed God to answer my prayers ever. Like what Smith Wigglesworth says, he's more willing to answer than we are willing to ask. We had to write a song called that. He's more willing to answer than you're willing to ask. <laughs> Get on that. Smith Wigglesworth saw some amazing miracles, man. But he believed God was more willing to answer than he was to ask. That's called grace. That Smith Wigglesworth was believing in the grace of God. Believing that God was more willing to answer them than he was willing to ask. And that's what happens. We get, we get all bound up in doubt because we're, we're worried about asking for whatever reason. We think God won't answer our prayers, even though Jesus makes it very clear. Whatever you ask, it will be given to you. And he said it like three or four times in the Gospels. And we have trouble. You know, and we want to start singing songs like that, you know. Or that is a song that, what's her name, sings? When you don't move the mountain, I needed you to move. And I, I mean, I think it's cool. I mean, I will trust you. I will trust you. That's, that's cool. I mean, that part of the Bible, that part of the song's okay. But, but it's just teaching us when you pray, God doesn't answer your prayers. We need to change up our songs. I think we'd actually would start seeing mountains moved if our songs were better. <laughs> but our songs don't teach us. Our songs uh, teach us. I don't know. Our songs are. Not good sometimes. They're not biblical. James, the book of James, you know. You pray you don't receive because you ask amiss. That's what that song should be saying. <laughs> Instead of when you don't move the mountain, I needed you to move, I will trust in you. Say, no, let's go to James. It says, when you don't get what you ask for, you ask amiss. To spend it on your own evil desires. Oh yeah, that's why God didn't answer. But that's not even that's not even the whole answer. We've also discovered in our teachings and stuff that that it's by it's that by faith. And so whenever the disciples couldn't cast out the demon, they said, How come we didn't? He says, Because you're unbelief. So it's unbelief and asking amiss. But we just want to stay, we just want to stick with asking amiss, because we really don't want to put it on ourselves. Not really. When they say that, cast out the demons hmm? and do all that, that could pertain to anything, right? Like ankle or anything. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about, well, think about this. <clears throat> he says a demon, but in the Bible also it says epilepsy. When you go down to the doctor, they're not going to say that epilepsy is a demon. They can say it's a medical condition. 
And I believe that every sickness and everything that, that hinders our life is the work of the devil. That's what I believe. Uh, I think there's even a scripture that even talks about it, um, about when he was healing people. He was delivering people from the power of the devil. I can't remember where it is. I have to find it. But anyway... Um, I'll find it. Oh, yeah. Acts chapter 10. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And so he's talking about Jesus. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand what God, that God shows no partiality, but in every nation everyone, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to, it, to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. You know, I find it interesting that some of the denominations, they'll say, yeah, we get saved. And they'll say, yeah, the word healed means saved. But they won't say that the word saved means healed. <laughs> They'll tell you, yeah, man. When he says here healed, we're talking about emotional and spiritual healing. <laughs> like, come on. The word sozo, saved, means healed, body, soul, and spirit. All three. Not just soul, not just spirit, but actually in your body. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So I believe that every sickness is oppression from the devil. If we can get that, we can get healed. Because then we're not we realizing we're not fighting God. A lot of times people don't want to... Hmm. I get a question there. Mm-hmm. So you're saying like asthma or something like that is... Okay, well, if you're born with that, how are you born with the devil? Already, oppressed by the devil. Okay, how are you oppressed by the devil if you... <clears throat> because the devil doesn't respect you and doesn't care whether you did good or evil. He's still going to oppress you. In fact, the Bible is very clear that even if you're a good man, the devil will oppress you just because you're a good man. Because he wants you to get rid of your faith. Okay, so if a young kid, a baby... That has done nothing. Has done nothing. It's born with asthma. Yeah. Or some type of problem. It's the work of the enemy. And it's our job as Christians to have faith and believe and go and heal those people. There's a scripture that talks about um, the blind man. Let's find that one up quick. John chapter 9. Too often we want to point the finger. So earlier you asked me a question about the, you know, God sending that evil spirit on Abimelech, remember? And so right now your mind might be thinking, well, see, if something was evil sent, then maybe it's judgment from God, right? And so a lot of times that is the case. But many times it's not the case. We can't sit here and point the finger at God and be like, oh, God did that to that kid. No, the Bible says that the, that the sins of the people visit the third and fourth generation, okay? So sometimes our sin is caused by ourselves. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes our, the things that happen to us that are evil, that, that say, say like, uh, say uh, something evil that happens to us, sometimes it's because of our sin. Sometimes it's because of someone else's sin. And it doesn't have to be anybody who even is close to you. The scripture is very clear. Um, whenever the people were fighting with God, or fighting um, on God in God's army against the people that were intruding, they were um, invading. 
they uh, they conquered that first city, and they God told them, "Look, devote everything to destruction. Don't get rid of, don't don't keep anything. I'm telling you, don't keep anything." Well, they disobeyed. Okay, one guy disobeyed. He kept some stuff. I think some silver or something like that from the previous battle. Well, they went into the next city, and 38 men died in battle, and they they were like, "Oh, we really lost big time." And because you have to understand, they they operated perfectly when they went to battle, they didn't lose anybody. Okay. The enemy was the only one that died. They didn't lose anyone. So when they went to battle the second time, they lost 38 people. And they went tuck tail and running, thinking something's wrong. You know, 38 people, man. That's not a lot of people to lose in a battle, right? But they lost 20, They lost 38 people. It is a lot of people, but don't get me wrong. Um, I'm saying that they dominated when they went to war because God was with them. So when they disobeyed, then they started getting whooped up on. Okay, but it was only one guy who disobeyed. Those 38 people didn't do anything wrong. They obeyed God. But the one guy in the camp, because of his sin, his sin affected everybody. So that's important. That's why we have to remember our sin can affect other people. It's important to know. Because if we don't realize the implications of our sin, then we become selfish in our thinking and say, oh, I'm not hurting anybody. That guy didn't do. That's what we think. Oh, I'm just hurting myself. That's not what happened with that guy. Israel had to suffer. The people that they were with suffered. Thirty-eight men didn't come home. They lost their husbands and lost their fathers because one guy kept some silver. So what we see is, even though they didn't sin, sin doesn't respect. Sin does not respect you. It doesn't sin does not play fair. Let's put it that way. See what I'm saying? So, they had to make things right and ended up killing that guy. Um, and then they went to battle and started winning again, you know? <laughs> they killed that dude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we live in the New Testament. <laughs> Jesus Jesus was the one who died for us. And he didn't do anything wrong. So we are living in a different covenant. Okay? But the same rules apply. You have to keep covering it in Jesus. Keep this in mind. Everything that we get nowadays operates by faith. Okay? And if you don't take Jesus and apply it to your situation... You won't receive grace for that area. The reason why is the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And people say, well, no, the devil was defeated. Yeah, he was defeated. But you have to understand when God told him, I've given you the land, they didn't have the land yet. He said, I've given you the land. Go take the land. So he had already given, spiritually speaking, you know, prophetically speaking, had already given them the land. Okay? But they had to go take the land. Little by little. Come at grace. Yes. It's giving you grace. It's already giving you grace. You just have to go get more. You have to go believe and you have to go be multiplied and grow in grace and you go and conquer things in your life. So you're not going to be fixed overnight. Well, sometimes you get, you are fixed overnight. But are you submitting to it? See? Think about even your own situation. You know, you were already fixed. If you think about it, it, you were compelled to do what was right. You were already fixed. Inside, you've been changed. So you told me before, I'm so afraid of failure. You've already been changed on the inside. Now the inside has to overtake the outside. You've already been changed, buddy. You're a new boy. You're a new creation. It's a baby. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> it. You, everything that God has created you to be, already inside of you. It's already inside of you. It's a matter of yielding to that. So you're changed immediately. We may have to go through some bumps and stuff to continue to grow in that. That makes sense? But if we don't believe God's already changed us, we won't become what he's already changed us into. We have to believe that. If we keep on telling ourselves, well, I'm a work in progress... 
Yeah, you're a work in progress, but if you keep saying that, you're going to keep giving yourself an excuse not to live right. You're not a work in progress. You've already been made new. Now you need to renew your mind to what you've already been made new. You see? It's the flesh that resists what's happening on the inside. Now, your body says, man, I don't want to do all that. You know, that's how I get conflicted. You, you know, that's why you have this called double-mindedness. You want to do what's right. See, on the inside, you've been completely new. Completely brand remodeled, right? On the outside, the body hasn't died yet. You have to kill it. You have to tell your body, shut up. You're a slave now. That's why you have these conflicting wills. I want to do the right thing. Put it over here. I really want to do this. So it's called double-mindedness. The Bible says that man should not expect to receive anything from God for he's unstable in all his ways. So what we got to do is we got to tell our body, shut up. So how we do that? We fast. We separate from the world. That's why we have the barracks. That allows people to separate from their unhealthy environment and let their body detox, in a sense, from the world itself. We're not talking about just drugs. Your body has to detox from the influence of the world. When you get in the Word, and that's why you start feeling this change in you. And you're experiencing things you've never experienced before. The presence of God is so thick on your life. Because you've separated yourself from the world. But if you were to go back in the world and start dumping all the world back on you, you would start to feel that the presence of God is not there. And it's not because He's left you. It's because we've been filling ourselves up with things of the world. Make sense? So even though I'm not in the barracks, there's a lot of things I don't partake in because I know that it takes away from my intimacy with God. And that feeling you have of having the presence of God, I, I want that all the time. How do I maintain that? I don't go and binge watch um, Netflix. I don't get on my Facebook and scroll down for hours. I don't, it, I don't fill my brain up with things of the world. I get in the Word. See what I mean? I fill up with God's Word. God says, the Scripture says God is an all-consuming fire. He wants to consume your life. I like to use the illustration of uh, the burnt, Moses in the burning bush. God's an all-consuming fire. He wants to consume your life. That's why whenever we're going about in our wilderness and we see someone who's on fire for God, it's a distraction. That's why he says he turned aside to see why the bush was burning but was not being consumed. It was a mystery to him. When you're on fire for God, people start to look at you. Why is he got on fire? But he's not being consumed. I'm going to go see this thing. And they go, they go meet that guy. And they encounter God. The guy's not God. The bush wasn't God. It was just a bush. God was in the bush. God's in you. God wants to consume your life so you can be a distraction to other people that are called by God. We need to distract people from the world. Our life needs to be so on fire for God that when other people are living their normal life in the world, they can't help but notice us. And only through them meeting us will they have the opportunity to encounter God. And when they encounter God, their face will shine like Moses came off the mountain. That's good. What was I getting into? John, John chapter 9? Oh yeah, John chapter 9. You were asking a question about, about the being born that way. <clears throat> and as he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So they had this, he had this oppression in his life, right? He's saying, <clears throat> who sinned? You have to understand, too, sin is not a respect of persons, okay? And, and God... Scripture says God desires mercy, okay? That mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, so remember that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
He said, who sinned, his parents or him or this man or his parents that he was born blind? How could that guy have sinned if he was before he was born? That's my question. Who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Were they banking on the fact that one day he would sin and so that's why he was born blind? He was getting punished before he did the sin? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool in Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So the disciples had the same question. Well, why? Why was he born blind? He says, for only one reason. Forget all that other junk you're, you're talking about. We're just going to heal this guy. <laughs> you know? Another thing, too, is if it was of God, you know, you understand, if it was of God, and even if it was of God, let's just say... Let's just go with both ideas. Either way, it doesn't matter because we can still debunk the whole idea, right? Because both of them work. Because God set it up that way. Because God's wisdom is just great like that. Okay, so let's say it is from God. Um, why would Jesus be rebuking his father? Like, you know what I mean? If, if God made someone blind, wouldn't it be the will of God for him to be blind? And why would Jesus be healing somebody counter to the will of God? Doesn't make sense. So obviously God's ultimate will for that man was not for him to be blind. You see what I mean? We think a lot of times if everything that happens is God's will. Well, if it happened, it must be God's will. But that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Even though a lot of people think the Bible teaches that, they just read some things out of context, I think. No, it's very clear. Why would God? Same thing with, you know, people say, well, God is in control, and the storms happen, and they say, yeah, see, that's God. God's making the storm happen, right? Look at God. Look at the storm. I believe God is the peace in the storm. I don't know if God is the storm. Unless it's actually judgment. So we've seen that. I think there's even a scripture that talks about God being a tempest, you know, which is a hurricane, you know. Or big storm. So we see God in the storm, but only in judgment. So then Jesus is in the boat, and it's storming, and he rebukes the storm. He rebukes the storm. So if God's in the storm, then God then Jesus, God got rebuked by Jesus? <laughs> that makes sense. Unless there's some loopholes here. Unless there's some legal loopholes. Right? If someone sins, is it? Think about this. Is it if someone? Is it safe to say that when someone's thrown into hell, that that's the will of God? Well, we know already it's not God's will for them to perish, right? But the Bible teaches us that God's the one throwing him into hell. Okay, that's what Jesus says. Don't fear man, who can destroy just your body, but destroy, but, but fear him who can destroy your body and hell, your body and soul in hell. In some translations, it says, who can throw your body, who will throw your you into hell. Okay? So, well, I've heard people say, God doesn't throw people into hell. Because they've gotten so far on the other, other kick, saying that God ever, doesn't ever do anything bad. No, judgment is good. There's two wills of God. Righteousness. Righteousness, ultimately, is God's perfect will. Okay? So, if we don't receive Jesus, which makes us right then we are punished for our sins. You see what I'm saying? The judgment of God makes it right. So even hell is technically the will of God. It's just not his ultimate will. You see what I'm saying? It's a will, but it's not his ultimate will. He wants he, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment is still the will of God. But mercy's God's ultimate will. Does that make sense? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Am I, am I making any sense there? All right, so let's say the storm was ordained by God. How come Jesus could 
If, if it was ordained by God, the Bible says, who can, who can contend against God? So how did he rebuke the storm if it was from God? So there's, there's two thoughts here, that the storm wasn't from God, right? It's from the devil. So then he rebuked the devil, and the storm stopped. That's one school of thought. But really, the other school, the other school of thought works too. That if chaos was ordained by God because of sin that entered into the world, it's okay because Jesus came to pay for that sin, so he can rebuke the storm. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. And Jesus was the one bringing mercy into the world. You see? That's good stuff. Am I making sense? No. So even if it was, you know, people say, well, do you think it's, uh, you know, because of sin that, we're, that I'm being sick and stuff? I just look, the Bible's very clear. If you repent, I'll relent. So let's say it is from God. Let's just go with that school of thought for a minute. Let's say God is sending sickness on you because of some sin in your life. The easy answer is repent. If you repent, he will relent. The Bible's clear. The Bible says that over and over and over again. If you repent, I will relent. I will remove the sickness from you. Okay? So even if it was the judgment of God, there's still a way out. You see? But... If you're a believing Christian, the scripture says in Isaiah 54, if anyone fiercely assails you, it's not from me. So we know now that um, if anyone fiercely assails you, it's not from God. So we know now if you're in covenant with God, that if something comes against you, that's not that's no longer God's will for your life. That's not what God wants. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter whichever school of thought we go with. Jesus is the answer. He's the perfect wisdom of God. If the devil's coming against you, you have victory over him. You have authority over him. The, devil, the, de the, the Bible teaches us that we have authority over the devil. If God's coming against you, it's okay because you have mercy and forgiveness for Jesus. So you can get that taken off of you too. <laughs> that makes sense? It doesn't matter. Either way, whatever school of thought you believe, still Jesus answers it. <laughs> and honestly, the Bible has evidence for both. So that's why I like to teach both. Because when you read it, you get confused. Like, I thought God didn't send nothing to you. But right here in the book of Judges, Abimelech, God sends an evil spirit on Abimelech. What the heck? <laughs> Judgment. If Abimelech had repented, which I don't know if... You have to understand, back in the Old Testament, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So you would kill somebody, you die, you know? So there wasn't the, the same mercy and forgiveness that comes through Jesus, you know? That you, I'm telling you what, Jesus, we have it good in the New Testament. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, the, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll, be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your news feed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boldest Align Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day